I'm turning up a little bit white? Because that's usually me. And um, now I think we may as well get on with it. So this talk is called A Decade of Dewey's Decision. Um, and has my... Yeah, come on. No, too short after that. There we go. So, um, okay, so what the heck is that about? Well, basically this is um, me doing a strange, random, and not particularly a chronological summary of um, ten years of being in the Bell community, or um, perhaps more accurate, ten years of inflicting myself on the Bell community. Um, though so far I seem to have gotten away with it. Um, I mean, you, you can sort of look at this as an origin story. Uh, yes, no, I mean, okay. A fair chunk of this is going to be talking about myself, although, um, you know, <coughs> while I could perfectly happily talk just about myself for 50 minutes, I tend to be of the opinion that talking about yourself for that long is something that should be done behind closed doors. Um, but there's ba the, the other theme of this is basically, this is everybody else's fault here, we're about to see why. Uh, so, um, back in 2000, I got my first ever real programming job which was a, a pocket ISP, and bear in mind the dot-com crash was just starting. So basically there were two sorts of companies around at that point. The ones who were complete cheap bastards, and the ones who went bust. Um, fortunately I was working for one of the former, so I was underpaid but still employed. However, um, I originally got hired to do a Visual Basic 6 code, um, on the basis of having done some BBC Basic, remember, cheap bastards. Um, <laughs> Can you start over, Matt? No! <laughs> 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 Relate to your own talk as well. Off! <laughs> so, after four days of Visual Basic 6, um, there was a backup accident which wiped out a bunch of Perl code that was going on. I'm not entirely sure how a backup accident wiped out both copies. Um, when I attempted to figure out what had actually happened, the basic answer was the backup guy was stoned off his face. Um, it was a 2000 ISP. We had about half a nine bar, went through second line support every Friday, and got divvied out among the technical stuff. Uh, um, so one of the managers went, hey, you said you knew Pearl. I'm, I'm kind of like, uh, well, I sort of mentioned having looked at it once in the interview, because I thought maybe that would sound good, but... Yeah, okay, whatever, so I'll, I'll try. Um, so they handed me the, what, what was at that point, the Bible in three parts. Um, these days I think it would probably be Ovid's Beginning Pearl, Chromatics Modern Pearl, Go Look on Sea Pan and Learn what that is. But you know, these, these were calmer, quieter, more sensible days. Well, thinking of that as more sensible than anything, doesn't matter. Um, I mean, you know, we, we, we were great. We were using um, Pearl 5.6 on BSDI. We didn't use CPAN, we totally use CPAN. DBI counts as CPAN, right? Yes. <laughs> that was the only module we actually used. Uh, we had a copy paste to query parser because nobody had discovered CGI.pm. Uh, we had this magnificent thing of a script that took HTML and did a bunch of escaping on it and formatted it into print statements one by line because my predecessors hadn't discovered Perl had multi line print statements. Um, <laughs> That was, that, that was, that was um, not one of my happier moments when I realised just how much time I'd wasted on that one. Um, and then the back end for it was Microsoft SQL Server 7 running on the Office primary domain controller because that was a great idea. <laughs> MS SQL on an overloaded MP4 box. Whee! Anyway, um, later we migrated it to MySQL and that was honestly actually an improvement. Um, but I, I somehow managed to make this stuff work, um, at least for some value of work. In that it was great for the first two weeks, and then it was a web stats package. Then somebody sold it to nationalrail.co.uk, uh, which had just launched, and everything caught fire. Um, and the, the, the main reason for this was that I had to self teach myself SQL off a bunch of tutorials that the other guys in the office recommended. Um, to this day, my world would have been a much happier place back then um, if they'd been slightly more advanced at SQL themselves and therefore had recommended me a tutorial that told me group by existence. <laughs> yeah, I was doing that in software. That was, oh, anyway. Um, not the point. So that, that was how I first ended up writing Perl code. Then uh, in 2004, 
Um, I had achieved the heavy, uh, the heavy heights of working for Netcroft. Oh, sorry if I mispronounced that. Um, there, there, there's, there's, quite a, there's probably a few people here who've gone through there and will understand why that certain slip of the tongue might have happened. Um, especially since I, during that period I was running both the web server survey and the SSL server. And that meant all of this stuff had to run once a month, every month, to get the data out. And it theoretically had make files, but I was told when I arrived, nobody's been maintaining the make files for three years. Treat them as documentation, but you'll have to run all the steps by hand. Um, which would have been better if the steps hadn't been a mix of bash, uh, orc, said, pearl, and production critical seashell. <laughs> yeah. Um, Tom, Tom Christian's seizure considered harmful was basically the thing I cried myself to sleep at night over at that point. Um, so I, ne I needed a distraction um, and found it in the form of inline guile because uh, I've been learning a bit of lisp anyway. Um, so inline guile is basically a wrapper at guile.pm which is an interface to GNU guile and of course guile is a scheme in the grand tradition of naming programming things after terrible puns. Um, and the thing about Scheme is, Scheme has call with current continuation. So the reason I was doing this was, I had a bunch of event-driven code that I wanted to write to, in order to be able to do parallel I.O. But, I didn't <coughs> want to have to write the top-level control logic in parallel. So obviously the answer was to mix in one guy and Poe, write the top-level logic in Scheme, have it capture a cool CC which would then be reinvoked when the event came back from home. This actually worked really well. Um, except for the fact that gale.pm was kind of busted. Um, it, it, it wasn't so much a works on my machine problem on the developer's part, it was actually a only works on my machine problem. <laughs> because it turned out the makefile.pl didn't run unless you had a previous version of the module already installed! <laughs> so I fixed that, um, hacked a couple of extra bits into the C code to get more data types back and forth with Perl, um, wrote this up as a patch, sent the patch to the author, and so this is the first person that I'm going to blame for everything, which would be Sam Traeger, who was the original author of, in of Guile and Inline Guile. Because he, he replied via email very promptly with, you know, I really don't care about this module anymore. And then I read the second paragraph of the email, which was, sign up for pause, I'll give you code, <laughs> So I, I duly went, went, went through the pause sign up process, emailed him, received code, and did my first CPAN release, then promptly got distracted and never actually deployed the code I'd been writing, which, you know, story of all of our lives, I think. Um, but um, this, by the way, is why my pause ID is MS Trout, which is about the only thing left that has that format. And the reason for this was, this was 2004, so it was actually before I'd adopted MST as a nickname. <laughs> yeah, there, there, was, there, was, there was once a time where people actually called me by words rather than initials. <laughs> anyway. Um, so, moving on, um, in 2005, just let me check my timing, yeah, that looks about right, cool, so in 2005, um, Shadowcat was just getting rolling at this point, point. Uh, and we were doing various custom e-commerce builds based on Maple, who remembers Maple? I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, so, like I said, our, ours wasn't just Maple, it was... Um, basically, an XML definition that ran through some XSLT transforms to generate an executable XML dialect <coughs> because I hadn't yet heard of Ant and realised what a terrible idea that was, um, which then basically executed itself and used Template Toolkit to generate mod Perl apps so I could have multiple applications in the same mod Perl, which then required a namespace per application. So you couldn't just use the Perl code because you needed to generate out the package lines. Um, in, I, I, I'd say in my defence it seemed like a good idea at the time, but that's not really a defence. It, 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 it was a spider baby. It, it was a spider baby made entirely out of crack and nightmares. Um, and I, I, I will point out, anybody who's ever played with um, some of Simon Cousins' hairier code? 
um, will be very much aware that the man was, um, you know, generally quite adventurous in terms of what he was willing to do with Pearl. But on the one, and he, he was the original author of Maple. On the one occasion where he ended up collaborating on a project with us, yeah, it terrified him. In, in hindsight, it probably should have terrified me as well. But um, so, at, at the point at which I realised this is maybe a bad idea, I started hunting for something else. So I was googling around and, and fell, ac fell across this new thing that I'd never heard of before called Catalyst. <laughs> um, so I hopped onto the IRC channel, waved at people, um, started reading through the source code. Um, Ex explain some of the things I was considering doing with it, if, if, assuming I could manage it. I, I recall the fantastic comment of um, Sebastian Riedel saying, this destroys everything I believed in, um, which is a fairly common comment on my code over the years. Um, but so, um, I was reading through the source code to understand it, because clearly that's how you learn a library. I, I've heard there's this thing called documentation that some people read, but um, nah, read the pearl, it's way more fun. Um, though I, I, I would point out that I learned Angular.js by loading the source code onto a tablet and then sitting several nights in the pub with a beer reading through it. So I, I, am, I am possibly an outlier and should not be counted. It worked! <laughs> Don't face bombs so loud you can curse yourself. Um, and I spotted a bug in the Regex dispatcher. Um, so I, I mentioned this and I said, right, what well, might be a batch then? Um, so I'm like, what, what, really? Fine. So I actually got my, my first patch into a CPAN module within 24 hours of arriving on our seat of Pearl Hall, completely by accident. Um, stuck around on RC, which uh, in hindsight may have been a tactical error on my part. Um, and then a little later, uh, Marcus Ramberg had been running all of the infrastructure for the project at the time. Um, notably the Subversion Repository. Uh, it, it was 2005, the Subversion Repository was a sensible thing. Um, if anybody wants to, wants to know what isn't a sensible thing, ask me down the pub how you do interactive rebates on a Subversion Repository with VR. Um, however, it's not that difficult. Um, so I, I, I was like, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll take over doing that. Um, you know, I had, I had at several previous jobs been the only person using source control, so I'd had to install and set up all of the source control stuff myself because, you know, it's the way it goes, right? But that was all CVS, so I'm like, oh, I get to learn something from this century! Um, and, and ended up inheriting a, a server which for some reason was running Debian Unstable. Um, fortunately, this was during the period when Debian Unstable was basically uh, just as geologically stable as the rest of it, so it didn't actually break. Uh, but that, that was definitely a mistake, um, on the basis of we are still hosting subversion repositories uh, that haven't yet been converted to Git. But, um, so, as we were winding up for um, the Catalyst 5.50 push, um, I had an idea, because I'd spent quite a while in the dispatcher code by this point and was starting to get a little bit annoyed by it. So I thought, yeah, maybe, maybe I'll refactor it. Um, so I explained, to, uh, I explained to people that um, I had an idea for this, and this would be the next crucial mistake on the part of Sebastian Riedel, who said, we'll make a branch there. I went, but I don't have a connector. He goes, what, you're the repository admin? <laughs> yes, I can administrate it without giving myself privileges. Therefore I have done, because that's how you administrate things. Um, to which his response was basically, well that was stupid, give yourself a commitment and then make a branch. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, 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 do, I do honestly miss those days. Um, those, those, those of you who, um, pay, who, who pay attention to um, community interactions may be aware that these days Sebastian and I don't get along as well as we might. Um, but back in those days, back in those days, he and I made an amazing team. Um, we're, we're just basically both crazy bastards, so it, it was bound to fail eventually, but for a while, you know. Um, Sebastian was project leader, I did a lot of the architecture stuff. Sebastian designed really nice, elegant APIs, um, and then I rewrote his implementation, so we still maintain backwards compatibility with the older stuff. Um, and he did all of the evangelizing and marketing and convincing other people this was awesome 
and I got to sit and be an infrastructure geek, which honestly was far, far preferable from my point of view. Uh, believe, believe it or not, at that point, the idea of actually having to talk to people wasn't really my thing. Um, which is funny, because these days you can't shut me up, but... Um, <laughs> meanwhile, um, the primary ORM for both Maybell and Catalyst was Class DBI. And um, I've been messing around with some stuff. Um, Christian Hansen wrote a thing called Class DBI Suite, which resulted in me writing... Um, adding join and prefect support to that, um, and mostly because somebody said, Rails has this, and I don't think you can do it with Class DBI. So obviously 24 hours later I had working code, because you, you can't tell a pro programmer something's impossible. It's not allowed. Um, but Class DBI at that point was creaking at the seams, and um, Lots of people uh, were poking around in the internals, so we're basically relying on encapsulation breakage, relying on bugs. Um, one of the few occasions where um, bookings tendency to basically do an S slash slash on their code, stick booking on the front of the namespace, and just maintain their own private fork was an improvement on doing things sensibly. Um, but it was creaking. Um, so I spoke to Tony Bowden, who was then the, the class DBI maintainer, and went, I, I, I don't see how we can extend the review of this without breaking stuff. Uh, so maybe we should do research on how we do a version 2. Um, and Tony, in his infinite wisdom, said, yeah, that's a good idea. Go off and do that. <laughs> so I, I, I thought about this, and I... I Fortunately, I was sufficiently angry at Class DBI to not realise what a terrible idea this was. Um, blinded by my rage at the existing code base, uh, I, was th I was thinking, okay, so what, what do I call this temporary project while, I'm, um, figure while, I'm, while we're figuring out how to do Class DBI V2? And um, this was the point at CL Cow, at which CL Cow went, well, you know, Class DBI wasn't really the correct namespace for that, because technically it's a DBI extension. So I think you should call it DBIX Class. <laughs> uh, then Tony, Tony burned out basically because he was in the process of selling his company and lawyers and, and you, he was a geek. Having lawyers trying to screw him over repeatedly was not good for his stress levels. And he basically hit a point of, no, screw this. You're on your own, have fun, I'm going to go and do something else. Like lie down in a darkened room where there are no lawyers and weep quietly. Um, in the same situation, I, I might have exploded rather than imploded, but I doubt otherwise I would have done any better. Um, so um, so we, we, we don't, we've totally gone. Suddenly, hash DBX class gets swarmed with users. So that, that would be... Um, Probably dozens of dubious decisions right there all being made in the same few days. Um, and I, I, I was stuck with it since till I managed to palm it off on reposition. Uh, but, uh, yeah, yeah, this was, a, this was not what I had in mind. It's a research project. Why are you deploying random versions of Subversion Trunk into production against your live database? What? Um, which is kind of how I got obsessed with Back and Pack, because that scared the stuffing out of me. I'm like, I know what this code is like on the inside. Uh, anyway, uh, so go, going further back, um, just, just for a moment, because the, the, the question is, how did I get into this stupid cascade of insanity in the first place? And um, the answer is an odd set of coincidences. Um, the first one being, I went with my parents in 98, I think, to a Discworld convention. And then, for reasons I, in hindsight, still don't understand, I attempted to take theatre studies at Sixth Form College. And on a theatre studies trip, I was wearing that t-shirt. And made friends with a couple of Pratchett fans during the interval who lived in Lancaster. And as a result of that, ended up moving to Lancaster. Then, through a bunch of connections made from there, Join Mark Keating's Dungeons and Dragons group. <laughs> that would be how he and I first met. Um, and the rest is, yeah, is, is kind of history and all the rest of this talk. 
So, um, I, I'm just going to take a moment and say, um, without Terry Pratchett and Gary Gygax, I wouldn't be here. I am not so arrogant as to blame them, since this talk is mostly about blaming everybody else. Um, but, rest in peace. Maybe we can find one with the clacks overhead for both of them. Now, uh, so, go back to Catalyst. Um, all good things must come to an end. Um, so, Sebastian Riedel departed to um, spend a number of years basically ignoring everybody and experimenting. Um, and eventually, eventually, after a number of false starts, came out with Modulacious, which is his vision of the future. Meanwhile, we had a very popular framework, we had a bunch of people with a bunch of ideas, but nobody was actually starting on the ideas. And I'm, 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 look, I'm looking at the, main, at the dev mailing list. People are talking about features they like, people are talking about ways you could build the features. People are talking about what would be a good idea to have in a release, but nobody's actually working on anything. And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of sat there going, these are all really good ideas. What are you waiting for? Seriously, are you waiting for somebody to shout go or something? Oh, uh, hang on a minute. Okay, I, I don't understand humans, so uh, let's see what happens. And I basically sent a bunch of emails to the list that consisted of shouting go at people. And suddenly we had a load of branches. Um, and people were developing stuff. And there was all sorts of nice things that got merged into 5.70. Um, my main contribution to that release was Chained. Um, I'm assuming there's at least a few of you who've used Chained Dispatching Catalyst here. And um, if you're wondering why it's both super powerful and a colossal <coughs> pain in the ass to actually learn in the first place, the answer to that fundamentally is... That's what you get when you have me with no Sebastian Riedel to design a sensible, human-friendly API. Um, he's got better at infrastructure over the years. I've got better at API design over the years. But he, he will always be ahead of me on making shiny APIs. And I, I really missed his input on that one. However, um, so suddenly development, great. And then suddenly people started acting like I was in charge. <laughs> What, what do, all I did was shout, go! <laughs> uh, I, 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 seriously, seriously I, I was completely and utterly confused by this. Um, but ba basically bold with it. And th this, this was the point at which I started getting into um, areas of the community that involve um, talking at, exhorting at, shouting well volunteered and whatever. Basically because, well, the... The guy who was good at it and liked doing it had left, and, and somebody had to. Um, but yeah, um, and it, the, the story keeps going this way, you will find. Like, um, IRC.pearl.org. Um, we do now have services. Uh, nobody seems to pay a lot of attention to them. My main interaction, honestly, with the services at this point is the OpaServe G-Line, which is really great when we get spammers. It's the IRC op equivalent of a flamethrower. It's so much fun. Um, less so for the spammers, but you know that's kind of the point, right? Um, so when you have channels run by opbox, you have to remember to re-op them after net splits and disconnects and whatever. Otherwise, they can't op people. Because if you run out, you then have nobody with plus O, and you can't fix it without an opa. Um, and you know, IRC.pearl.org many years ago was mostly just a social network with a handful of channels. And um, from 2005 onwards, we got more and more and more project-based technical channels. I helped set a lot of them up, and then when the people I'd set them up for screwed it up and left the op off the bot, I'd go and chase down an opa and beg them to restart a bot, and then I'd fix everything else. Um, which meant I kept bugging the opas for the first stage. Um, which comes to another dubious decision on the part of Pete Sargent, um, who got bored of me bugging him and went, here, have your own own line and go away. Um, which was actually quite successful, given I, I, I seem to be one of the default people that people come to when they've broken their channel, still like eight or nine years on from that. Um, but yeah. <laughs> and then, then from there I ended up 
um, tweaking IRC configs. Shadowcat started provisioning IRC servers basically because it was cheaper for us to pay to run servers than to have me having to jump off customer work in order to bulk the network back together when it fell to pieces. Um, and we're, we're still doing that because you know once you volunteer for something like that, you're stuck forever. Um, not that I mind, but you are stuck forever. Um, but you know we, we need IRC to build all the work. You know, we, we, we spend most of our lives doing consultancy and commercial support around SAPA. One of the reasons that we managed to get such a fast turnaround for customers is that I can go find the right channel and bug the person who wrote the code that I just snapped in half and fix it the way they want it first. So it, it, it's, it's kind of, you know, honestly, irc.pearl.org is more mission critical for me than most of the actual Shadowcat branded infrastructure in terms of getting my job done. Um, and the other nice thing is, it means we don't have to run our internal IRC to quite the same level, because if it falls over, we just regroup on IRC.pub.org. Um, I, I will note for the record, on a, on a few occasions, I've had the um, lead tech of another open source build, of other open source build companies come and grab me in query and say, hey, by the way, we basically just did that ourselves when our, our IRC lead fell over. Thanks for being our backup plan. We use you as our primary. Yeah, I, I don't think you were alone in that either. Um, the, the, one, the one that really made me happy was when, was when it turned out that um, Best Practical had reformed on IRC not Pearl at all. Because, you know, as, as an ex-pumpkin, we might owe Jesse Vincent just a little bit of gratitude. Um, but yeah, um, and a, a similar thing happened with Quartz. So, okay, when you're doing module adoptions, uh, which happen because, you know, it's a big ass ecosystem, there's lots and lots of modules, and maintainers are human, they have other lives beyond code, um, or at least the rest of them do. Um, so, you know, the people come and go. Um, and if they, dis if they disappear suddenly, you need to prove the old author's gone. If they just have no time at all, you need to get permission from them to do the transfer before they disappear. Um, and then if you can't get them to actually do it, you need a pause administrator. So you have to go to modules at Perl.org, send a bunch of emails, prove that you've satisfied all the prerequisites. And then there's, there's basically this huge pile of paperwork that some poor volunteer has to read. At which point they go into pause, click two buttons, and it's sorted. Um, so you, you can see where this might be going. This time it was Adam Kennedy's fault. Um, he and I had coordinated a lot of adoptions together. And eventually he basically went, you know, you're, you're, you're doing all of the chasing people down. I'm just clicking folks. I'm, I'm just going to convince Andreas Koenig to make you an admin as well. Um, which is how I got stuck with the sudo bit on pause. Um, it, it, it's mostly been helpful. Um, it has encouraged me to do even more toiling in the unmaintainium mines than otherwise. Um, <coughs> but there's a fair amount of help with that. And, you know, um, if nothing else, it's always really funny um, when you go in, take an author who I know has already given me permission to it, and then do a select all on their modules and go and co mate to somebody. And then watch the person cry when they when they next log into rt.cband.org. Um, I think Kevin Etheridge may have nearly killed me several times <laughs> by now. Yeah, then I had to go fix the SQL and the permissions page and pause because it was being too slow because I was doing it in one plus M queries. Yes, yes. The the the, the, the transfer to Cabal maintainership where like. Eight or ten people at once usually have co on an entire ecosystem. Pause really wasn't designed for that. And it, it did eventually creak a little bit. Uh, Search.cpan.org also wasn't designed for that. Um, but Graham Barr and I spent about two weeks emailing back and forth because a DBAX class release cycle back in maybe 07 completely and utterly broke Search.cpan's permission system. Um, because it, 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 it hadn't expected the idea of having multiple people doing dev releases towards the same major release. 
But I'm lazy. So clearly the answer was, you haven't done a release in a bit, you can do the next one. I can't be bothered making a tarball, have fun. Um, sometimes it was the person who contributed the most patches to that release. Sometimes it was whoever was handy and didn't run away fast enough. Um, occasionally I even did one myself, but that, that was plan Z. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so um, fast forward to 2010. Um, Jesse Vincent um, was pumpkin at the time and was working on this plan to basically make it easier to cut releases of Pearl 5 because we he was getting the annual release cycle thing into place. So obviously what you need is a bunch of people to do Irish mind clearing on the release process. Preferably people who have no idea what they're doing. Which is where I came in. <laughs> he went, why, why don't you do one of these? I went, I have no idea how you can do that. He went, and Jesse went, yes, good! <laughs> that means you're going to find all the holes in the documentation. Uh, I'm thinking, yeah, that, that will be fine. And then due to, um, I, I, I think due to parental related stuff, um, somebody else had to swap with me. And I said, yeah, I'll swap, that's fine. It wasn't until after I'd said yes, that I realised I'd swapped so that I was due to do a release in the middle of Yap CNA. <laughs> um, so I, I spent most of that conference in the speaker's lounge panicking about the release. Um, which was a new and interesting experience. Normally I spend most of the conference in the speaker's lounge panicking about my slides. Um, preparedness! I've heard of it! Anyway, um, so... And I failed at a bunch of details, I don't think the credits look quite right. Um, the eventual table did actually compile and install, um, apparently. Um, and my, the, the comment I then got immediately afterwards was uh, Rafael Garcia Suarez, who was the pumpkin for a lot of 5.10. Um, now, for context, this was the year I was doing the Iron Man forfeit talks. So, um, since Stephen Little had tried to make me go on stage naked, um, I, had en I, had en I had ended up having to, f having to find a way to work around that and ended up with white blonde hair. Um, I didn't want you naked, I just wanted you bald. <laughs> the terms of the bet were that if I couldn't find hair dye that colour, I had to wear clothes that colour, and you voted for transparent. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, um, at that point, I look something like that. Which meant that immediately after the release, RGS tweeted, Releasing Pearl 5, no so easy to come to <laughs> To which the only possible response would be, <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> um, so I also, uh, while I'm here, I want to mention a few other dubious decisions that um, were, well, were, were other people becoming my fault, perhaps. Um, the, the, uh, yeah, mostly involving people not running away fast enough when I had a clever idea. Um, the first of these, um, being our organiser today, Mr. Keating. Um, because back in 2005, after leaving Netcraft, I went, you know what, I think we should try and start a consultancy. That would be a great idea. I mean, after all, having seen Netcraft management, seriously, how hard could it be? <laughs> He still said yes. I'm, 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 not, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether, whether to thank, um, you know, um, his lack of sanity, alcohol, maybe several dealers, but whatever, he said yes. Um, I'm, I'm still not entirely sure why, but I'm really glad he did. <coughs> um, so, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm also going to call out a very foolish decision on the part of the NA and EU organisers. Um, which was to let me invent something called the state of the Velociraptor. Um, the, re the, reason for the, the reason for this being 
Um, but people kept going, oh, but the state, the state of the onion was always about Pearl Sex. Well, yes, that's because Larry is giving a keynote about the stuff he's been working on the last year, which is Pearl Sex! This is not his fault! Why are you blaming him for not talking about something he, 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 he's not even working on? There's a bunch of us maintaining it on his behalf. It's fine! A bunch of ungrateful muppets. Um, so that this was basically a State of Pearl 5 keynote. Um, the idea being that it, it was meant to be like the Pearl 5 community talking to itself. Um, given I always write my slides at the last minute, I always try to get them to schedule it on the last day. And about half the slides would be based on things people had been talking to me about during the conference. So that it wasn't just what I thought, it was what everybody I'd talked to had thought. Um, or at least the printable parts. Um, unprintable slides remain entirely my responsibility, obviously. Um, but yeah, and the idea was to stop people complaining at Larry, and also to create a situation where he wasn't forced by tradition to be the only keynote speaker, which he had been for years. Um, Columbus, Ohio was the first year in I don't remember how long when the organizers said to Larry, do you want to give a talk? Do you want to give a keynote? Do you want to do something else? Whatever. And Larry went, you know what? I think I'd like to just wander around the conference and talk to Pearl programmers. Because I actually quite enjoy that, and this would be the first time in a decade I've had a chance to just do that. Um, so he, 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 he duly did. Um, there were, we, we had a couple of other keynotes. I'm pretty sure Stephen <laughs> had one of them inflicted on him. You and me and Jesse. There we go. Um, <laughs> And at the, at the end of the first day of the Velociraptor, um, Larry came up to me, and I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning this just because it made me really happy, came up to me, shook my hand, and said, thanks for giving me a break. I'm going to be like, yay, I feel like a real contributor now. Um, possibly the only even remotely useful thing I've done towards Pearl Sex, but fortunately there's a bunch of far more competent people working on that. Um, but... The trouble with the community talking to itself is that means that the institution is more important than the person. The thing I was always aiming for was I'm just the guy who happens to be behind the microphone talking about what people have been talking to me about. Um, but after five years of me doing that, uh, people were more and more regarding it as what Matt thinks rather than Matt attempting, possibly unsuccessfully, to distill what everybody else thinks. Um, so, okay, how, how, do, how do you have an institution that, that survives the person? Well, if you're English, the first thing you think of has got to be Dr. Who, right? <laughs> so the only possible solution here is you replace, you keep the institution and replace the person. And enter Mr. Cyrex. We're not sure what the X stands for, it might be for extra. <laughs> If it is, given he said yes, that's probably extra government. Yeah. Um, Does it mean he's the tenth Sawyer as well as the second MSD? <laughs> <laughs> that's a terrifying thought, so I'm going to move on to the next slide. Uh, uh, but also, also extra awesome. So um, while, while, it, while it's probably um, doesn't carry nearly so much weight coming from me rather than our original progenitor, Thanks for giving me a break, dude. Uh, <laughs> so, um, last one. And um, because I've not been repeating myself nearly enough yet, let's have Mark Keating again. Um, now, this one actually was only partially my fault. And the rest of the blame I can lay on a man who isn't going to defend himself, the dear departed Greg McCallum. Now, those of you who remember him will entirely understand why I think I can get away with blaming him for things he probably have approved. For those of you who don't, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just going to give you my favourite memory of Greg at conferences. Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, the Yatsi EU auction one year. Um, I had just come through my entire conference talks without swearing for the first time ever because I'd made a bet with Jesse Denson. Um, and so in, 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 order, in order to compensate for this, 
I had a copy of the Catalyst book with me for the auction. And um, what my talks lacked in swearing, the leaf page of that book more than made up. At which point, when it came up for auction, Greg looks at it and goes, um, well, I thought Matt had signed this, but this appears to be an entire page of swearing. At which point, of course, the audience calls out, read it out! <laughs> um, so Greg goes, I'm not doing that, and the audience goes, read it out! And Greg goes, okay, for a hundred euro donation. <laughs> Five hands went up with 20 euros each within about 10 seconds. He should have asked for more money. Um, so, Greg, Julie... <laughs> and then read most of it out. <laughs> uh, so, um... Greg was London not PM leader at the time. Um, and was basically do, do, doing doing the standard approach of making leadership sustainable, which is you delegate absolutely everything to unwitting victims. Um, and he grabbed me on RLC and went, hey, I've had an idea. I reckon Mark would be really good at helping with LPW. I'm like, yeah, actually. I mean, after all, he's, he's managed to be Shadowcat's resident organized person for years, in spite of being stuck with me. Um, so yeah, clearly this, this is probably viable. Um, and so basically we got him to go, yes I'll help, and then we both legged it. <laughs> and Mark has been conference organiser here since. One of these years I'm probably going to help him do that to somebody else, but for the moment honestly it's just too funny. <laughs> <laughs> since we've worked out well then. Um, so I am I'm pretty much out of time in this slot, um, which is good because I'm also out of rubbish to spout at you. But um, if, if there's a moral to this story, um, which there probably isn't because it's me and I've never had much of an interaction with morals, um, don't wait for people to shout go. Bec um, because really, you know, if, if, if you have an idea, try it, see what happens. It's not going to, it's not going to go that badly wrong, really. Um, if you see somebody who's clearly waiting, shout go! Some, something I've seen lots of times. Somebody talks about an idea on IRC, and I think that's, re I, I think that's really cool. And people go, yeah, that seems going to be cool. And they go, yeah, well, I'm not sure. And then they're talking about it again. And, then, and then, like the third time, I've gone, ah, maybe, maybe I should rephrase this. That's a really good idea. Please have a go at it, and when you get somewhere, show me, and I'll have a look over it and tell me what I think. And it turns out, I mean, you know, this this worked back before people had any idea who I was. Seriously. So any any anybody anybody can wield this form of magic. Um, encourage people. Suggest to them that there is at least one person who will probably eventually want to use it. Um, because, because a lot of the time, people underestimate the quality of their own ideas. And you know what? If it turns out to be a terrible idea, it'll end up being a great story to talk about down the pub, at the very least. Um, which brings me to, you're probably the wrong person to do this. Most of, the, most of the stuff that I've done that people have been most excited about, I was definitely the wrong person to do this. Um, <laughs> I, 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 seriously, I, I could compete with Stephen on safe faults per line of code when I write so. Um, but Three Pumpkins told me it was impossible, so... <laughs> what, what do you do? Um, and I, I, I still didn't actually finish it. It's just at OSCOM, I was at the back of... It. This is Jesse Vincent again. All his fault, honest. Uh, I was at the back of his talk and he was showing off Jifty and the indirect object notation syntax that they use for declaring um, classes in their ORM. And he went, we really wanted to be able to do it without this, um, but we don't, but um, Audrey and I don't think it's actually possible in Perl. Um, so I managed to get it to compile just enough to demonstrate it worked by the end of his talk. <laughs> um, 
which resulted in possibly the most embarrassing way ever to uh, meet somebody. Um, which, which, is, which is basically, so I was showing it to him and he's like, wait, that actually works? And then from behind me I hear, well, that's a new way to mess with the Perl 5 compiler. <laughs> And I turn around, and that was how I first met Larry Wall. <laughs> <laughs> Took us several years to get over that. Fortunately, while Larry is a lovely, gentle, sweet person, his wife is the sharpest, sarcastic bastard I have run into in years. And I mean that as a huge compliment. I, 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 I seriously suspect that Gloria and my mother would have got on really well. Um, and Glo Gloria was able to translate a couple of things that I was trying to say into words Larry could actually understand. And then eventually he and I, as you know, men eventually managed to figure out a way to communicate without a woman filling in the social skills for us. Um, and it, it, it mostly sorted itself out later. Um, but, um, yeah. but the, the, the point here is, even if you're the wrong person to do it, one, you're going to be 100% better than nobody at all. And two, if there's one thing I've noticed over the years, most of the stuff that turns out to be important aren't done by the best person for the job, or the best place person, or the logical person, or even anybody who it would be remotely sensible for them to do that. Stuff gets done by whoever turns up. So, what I'm basically saying here is, turn up. It's fun. Really. Honest. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, everything is usually my fault, except for the things that are Greg McCallum's fault. Um, but um, if, if there really is a moral to this story, it's that everybody, everybody in this community is somebody else's fault. And in my case, blame Sam Traeger. Thank you very much. <laughs>